Voice in the Wilderness, Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week. It's not just knowing about the doctrine in the Bible. That is not what we stand for here. Streaming powerful, biblically-based messages live and down the internet. This congregation may never be gathered together again as we see it. Voice in the Wilderness, Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week. Good evening. Welcome to Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio. We are streaming live on the internet from London. This show is dedicated to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. On tonight's show, we will discuss the question, what does it mean to be deceived? We will be studying what the Bible teaches. Our guest speaker is based in Maryland in the United States of America. More about our guest after we've had some music.
What does it mean to be deceived? We will discuss this subject tonight with Elder Ray DiCarlo of Emmanuel Missionary Institute. EMI was established in 1992 by Elder Ray and his wife, Sister Judy DiCarlo. They have an educational ministry dedicated to the proclamation of the everlasting gospel of Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. For the past 30 years, EMI has been involved in teaching, evangelism, and literature distribution throughout the whole world. Let's now call Elder DeCardo and see if he's available. Hello? Hello, good evening, Elder Di Carlo. You are live on Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio. How are you this evening, Elder Di Carlo? I'm fine, thank you, John. Praise the Lord. Glad to hear that you're keeping well. Well, Elder Di Carlo, tonight we will be discussing these questions together. What does it mean to be deceived? How did deception enter into this world? Where is deception most likely to be found? What types of deception are there? And how can you ensure that you are not deceived today? So, Elder DiCardo, before we start our discussion tonight, shall we have a word of prayer, please? Mm. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity we have to take this time to study a very important topic in the light of the things that have been taking place in this world. We pray that you will grant us your mercy, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that we may understand the truth and more importantly, follow. We ask that your angels will watch over us and protect us. And now, dear Lord, grant us wisdom from above and common sense and a practical approach to this subject. Anoint our lips that we may speak the truth as it is in Jesus. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Elder DeCardo, what does it mean to be deceived? Well, you know, when you look up the word deception or deceived, uh, you know, it's to cause someone to believe something that's not true right. um, in order to, to gain an advantage. In other words, the, the motivation behind the deception is to gain an advantage over your opponent. Now, um, deception is very interesting. When you look at the Bible and uh, in terms of this subject, there's yes. more to the picture that has often been portrayed. Usually when we look at deception, we, uh, we look at the, the concepts um, of, of a few verses, which we will look at today. But the Bible is really um, – well, there's a, a number of verses that deal with the issue of deception yes. or to be deceived or misled or things of this nature. But um, to be deceived really comes down to the issue of one who is, who's been swindled right. um, or defrauded, someone who's been tricked or duped into believing something that, is, that, uh, that, um, that really is a lie. It's a falsehood. So deception is a very interesting thing because it has to do with the mind. Right. Um, it, it's really something that is um, uh, that's really Satan has brought about because it's it's not it, it doesn't originate with with uh, God. I mean, God is a, a God of truth. He's a God of of honesty. Uh, and as Isaiah says, come now, let us reason together. So you can tell that God has no desire to mislead, to, to dupe us, to trick us. But Satan has everything to gain to swindle us out of, out of our eternal life. So uh, there's no question uh, that uh, he's the author. Uh, he's the, the starting, you know, as we say, the linchpin. Um, and uh, of these issues. But when you look at deception, what does it mean? It really means that you have allowed your mind to be captivated um, by someone else. Um, and in the final analysis, you've allowed them to really control your thinking by, right. by manipulation. So your reasoning factor, the rational, 
you know, the co- thinking cause to effect, logic, as we say, you're right, that's a study of logic, metaphysics, uh, the metaphysical concepts of ideas of learning. So what happens is all of that is gone now. You've, you've allowed someone else to do your thinking for you. And so deception is really um, very, very dangerous. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, what does that imply? You may think something to be true. You may and be sincere. Now, you, the sincerity what? is a very interesting element regarding the nature of deception. I'm not questioning, nor is the Bible questioning the sincerity of someone's belief system. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're sincere about the position you hold, that the position you presently possess is the truth. In other words, sincerity doesn't sanctify error. And so sincerity doesn't override deception. In other words, you know, you can be sincere as you want to be regarding a, a, a lie. Now, you don't think it's a lie, but I mean, it is a lie in reality. Um, that sincerity doesn't, uh, doesn't excuse you in the eyes of God regarding what that deception will do to you. Because at the end of the day, whatever you sow, you will reap. So um, deception is really, uh, you know, it's, it's the issue of, of you're being swindled, you're being tricked, you're being right. deceived, you're being, you know, taken advantage of. And really, John, I'll tell you something, what our listeners need to really come to grips with. When somebody is being deceived, all right, you're, you're in a state of deception. It's because you're naive. So you're not really in tune to the idea that one, number one, usually when deception comes to someone or, or they are deceived, there's a hard, it's hard for them to come to the grips of, with the reality that they're gullible, they're okay. naive. Life. And so what you need to understand are two things. Number one is the natural heart of man is corrupt which then leads to the position that you can, if you're unguarded, you can be led down the path of error very easily. So you need to be on your guard. Watch and pray, Jesus said, watch and pray, lest you be led into temptation. In other words, lest you be led down the wrong path. So don't be naive about your own condition. Number two, um, don't be gullible about people around you. Don't assume that just because someone is friendly, they are a friend. Right. So don't assume, you know, someone smiles at you. That doesn't necessarily mean they are pleased with you. Um, You know, deception comes not only in many forms and, you know, in terms of its approach, but deception is very crafty. Um, it's very subtle at times. And uh, I find that when a person is naive about not only themselves, but those around them, they are an easy prey to be right. led astray. Right. So I just say, you know, when it comes to what does it really mean? Um, really, as I said, what we I, I looked it up in, uh, as I say, in dictionaries and, you know, trying to get a biblical understanding of the issue. Um, it means, you know, really being led astray. And I think it relegates itself down to the issue that uh, a person is fundamentally naive about themselves and about those around them. Right. Yeah, so I'd, I'd also like to share Psalms 101, verse 7. This is Psalm 101, verse 7, basically. This is just from the scripture to um, Elder Ricardo's given a, a summary of his findings. And I know for those who would like to see from Scripture themselves, Psalm 101, verse 7, it says, He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. See, and, and as Elder De Carlo was has shared and as he has broken down earlier, just, you know, the scriptures explain what he's basically has shared with us that to deceive is to tell lies. It's, 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 and then Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 17. There's another Bible text that Ty had found as well. And it says, He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. 
So we here we have mm-hmm. the contrast, you see, and as Elder Ricardo said, basically someone that tells lies is a fraudster. And yep. as we continue to look at this matter, because he's basically given us a summary of what he's going to share um, as we start this evening, let us now look at how deception entered into this world. Mm. Uh, John, uh, b- before we go to that, I, I do want to go back to the text you quoted in Psalm 101.7. Yes. Just sure. for a second. Just yeah, sure. a very interesting insight that uh, you you brought out here. And I want our uh, listening audience to really look at this. In a, in a, it says, he that worketh deceit shall not, that's emphatic, Yes. dwell in my house. I won't allow a liar, a deceiver. To be associated with me. Yes. Right. I'm not going to allow a charlatan no, to, to be uh, to, in my company. In other words, yes. I'm not going to harbor, I'm not going to harbor friendship with a, with, a, with a liar, with a deceiver, with a fraudster. Yes. So, in other words, clearly God is speaking here, not only in reference to himself regarding the nature of a liar, but also to his children regarding how their attitude should be towards those who are deceivers. Amen. You should not befriend a liar or a deceiver. In other words, I'm not saying you shouldn't attempt to do everything you can to lead them in the path of righteousness. Rightly so, you should. However, though, um, there's a difference between loving the sinner and loving the sin, and yes. and 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 and, and, uh, and or loving the sin. You know, you you don't love sin; you hate the sin, and you despise and turn away from that. If someone is unwilling to repent of their sins and is in a in a very uh, um, depraved con- depraved condition, yes. you know, you don't you don't sit there and harbor them, because that implies. You are condoning their behavior. It is well tr- spoken that Jesus did eat with the publicans and the sinners, but Jesus never participated in the practices that he knew that the publicans and sinners were doing that was wrong. They, yes. He never uh, you know, pr- uh, participated in perversion. So there's a difference here. But you see, he that worketh the seed shall not dwell in my house. And, of course, this is all speaking about God as well. You're not going to go you enter the, the sanctuary of the Lord. You can't be a, a, enter into the house of God being this way. Yes. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Now, this, I, won't even, I won't even allow you to, uh, you know, be in my association. I yes. just won't allow it. And so there's a very strong denunciation about these things. And rightly so, it should be. Be on your guard, friends. Don't be naive. Now, look, let's go in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 12. Yes. And let's look here at the origin, how it came about, what really took place regarding deception. So we're looking here at Revelation chapter 12. And let's look now here at verse 3. It says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail, look very carefully now, his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Of course, this representing the angels. This is, of course, let me summarize for the uh, listening audience. This is depicting the, the origin of the great controversy in heaven when Satan and Christ uh, we're, we're waging war uh, against each other, and uh, and uh, which is alluded to in verse seven. Uh, uh, there, in, where it says war was in heaven. So this is how Satan began his whole controversy, and he says, so it drew it to tail, uh, drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. For to devour her child as soon as it was born. So that you can see the, the controversy obviously starts in heaven, taken to this earth, and it depicts the great, fundamentally the great controversy yes. that Satan has not only with Christ but his church as well. Then you go down to verse 9, and look what it says here, here in verse 9. So we go over verses 3 and 4. Now we go to verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and the angels were cast out with him. So you can now understand the application more, more clearly. Yes. So we have Satan, who is deceiving 
uh, the angels, it says right there, he deceiveth the whole world. And of course, they're referring to the angels as well. So the question is, how did he deceive them? By what means, in other words? So if you look at this, he says he drew a third of the stars of heaven, meaning that they did by his tail. So if you go over to Isaiah chapter 9, if you go to Isaiah chapter 9, there yes. you will find what a uh, the tale represents in Bible prophecy. Isaiah 9, 15. Listen to what it says. Isaiah 9, 15. It says, the ancient and honorable, he is the head. So he's the, he's the, uh, um, um, someone who's, um, you know, he's the, 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 the top, the, the lead, someone who's yes. um, noble and virtuous. He says, the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tale. So how did Satan get a third of the angels of heaven to join him? How did he do that? He did it by lying to them, by deceiving to them. So when it says in Revelation chapter 12 that his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, he's talking about Satan lied to these angels. He deceived them, misled them, and a third of them followed him. Now, I'm going to stop right here just for a second because I want our listening audience to understand. These angels uh, that became demons, they were transformed into demons because a demon is nothing more than an angel that has fallen, that is now void of the character and attributes of God Almighty who created yes. them. So when they were created, they were created virtuous. They were created holy. They were created with power. They were created with with um, at the attributes of God Almighty. All right, now listen, but let, let, uh, uh, friends, please hear me. If these beings came from the hands of God Almighty and from the mind of God himself, how majestic and powerful and beautiful do you think they were when God created them? I don't think there's any words in the human, human language that could actually be fitting dis, a, a description of them. Yes. I think it goes beyond human comprehension. Now, if they're that intelligent, that brilliant, that, that uh, magnificent, how deceptive must Satan have been and how powerful would his deceptions be in order to convince them who were perfectly created when God made them to cause them to be led astray? Yes. So if Satan is that powerful, if he's that deceptive, if he's that crafty, and he can get holy angels, a third of them, to join him. What chance do you think you and I have when we are not holy, we are corrupt? Again, we go back to the doctrine of the depravity of man. Yes. If you look at man case, mankind in his natural state, man is corrupt, evil, demented, deranged. There is nothing virtuous in us from the top of our head to the sole of our feet. There is nothing in us that's any good. Uh, we have nothing to offer. We are. Uh, we have a natural uh, bent, uh, you know, disposition to do evil, to follow evil. Uh, what does that tell you? It tells you, for friends, against Satan. I'm talking about man in his natural yes. state, unaided by God, in his natural state. Uh, uh, what chance do you think you have against Satan? You don't have a chance. This, you know, at all. None. None. Now, the only hope we, that we have. Therefore, is really, really in Christ. Amen. The only reason uh, God's children, for the most part, again, there are always exceptions, but the really, I'm talking about a born again believer in Jesus Christ, is not led astray because that believer is found in Christ. Now Christ fights for him. In other words, now instead of having a carnal mind, as Paul talks about in the book of Romans, chapter five, six, and seven, and so forth, and eight, instead of the carnal mind, we have what? A spiritual mind. We have the mind of Christ. So how did deception enter this world? It entered through Satan being being uh, so crafty, so deceptive that he caused a third of the angels to fall. Yes. So if that's the case, I would say that, uh, that uh, we ought to heed the words of God and we ought to beware. Beware lest we're led into temptation. You know, the text you brought up again, once again. Psalm 101, that, that, you know, when you look at that very carefully and analyze that, 
I'm not going to allow someone. I'm not going to associate with someone. I'm not going to allow them to 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 harbor in my home, et cetera, et cetera. Who I know, who I know. Now that's the key word. You know, you're aware of who I'm not. Who is who I know is deceptive and yeah. misleading and and corrupt. I'm not going to allow that. Uh, one for self preservation. Number two, I don't want to give the false impression uh, that God uh, uh, sanctions uh, that behavior. Um, and so forth. So I tell you, if we are looking at something that's very important. Now, why do I bring all this up? Because, dear friends, Satan, and, and when you look at Jesus in the wilderness of temptation, when you look at the three temptations that came to him, in every single case, Satan used deception. He was using lies. Now, it was morphed into different various issues. But really, Satan was trying his very best to mislead Christ, to deceive him in some form of fashion. Yes. And, uh, and uh, think about this. You don't, you don't think that Satan unleashed everything he had on Christ? You know, in other words, if you look at the great controversy, Satan and Christ are not friends. They are they are uh, um, vehemently opposed to each other. Uh, they are enemies of the highest order uh, towards each other. Satan hates Christ more than we could ever fathom uh, uh, and or imagine. It's just unthinkable his oh. hatred towards him. And uh, so you can better well believe he's using every means at his disposal. To bring Christ down. Now think about this. What does he use in the arsenal that he has under his possession to try to get Christ to fall? He uses lies, deceptions, misleading quotations, etc. Now, if that's the most potent, uh, uh, powerful weapon he has at his disposal, you really think he's not going to use that on us in these last days, especially in the last days? So thank the Lord Jesus Christ, really, we should be praising God that Christ right. overcame Satan in the wilderness of the temptation. Because let me tell you something, friends, um, uh, that is the linchpin of victory for the Christian. It really is. That's the cornerstone. Yes. Well, listeners, um, there's not really too much more for me to say other than we need to... Look at the principles that, and the principle, again, that the scriptures been sharing with us. Who do we allow to be our associates? Who do we even, yep. even allow to be in our homes? Because yep, people yep. have become so unprincipled these days. As, and I agree with Elder Ricardo in that, yes, we give people a chance because we're all sinners that need to be saved by grace. But if someone is a continual out and out liar and deceiver, why should you have that person around them? And why should you even excuse their behavior? Because it's not only going to damage you, but those who are within your own circle, whether they be family or friends. And so, you know, especially us who claim to be Christians, God's calling us to, to stand for truth and for principle to preserve society from the wiles of the devil. And mm. so this, you know, this is food for thought. And um, yeah, so I'm glad that we are going through these points this evening. Now then, w this is most interesting. Where is deception most likely to be found? Mm. Oh my. Well, all right, let's look. <laughs> oh yes, so did Well, you know, oh, yes. uh, let's look here, Matthew 24, because when we look at that, where where is it most likely to be found? Often when we look at that particular uh, uh, type of question, you know, really the immediate expectation of some is to say, well, the, the deception's out, out in the world, the world's out there, you know, it's yes. it's always outside. It's, a, you know, well, okay, and I'm, I'm not disputing that, that's for sure. There's no question that deception is in the world. I mean, there's no doubt. I just look around you, friends, and you can see very clearly the world is being led astray. They are deceived. Um, however, though, let's look at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's going to yes. give us an eye opener. So here we come to Matthew 24. 
And by the way, just uh, to make a point of reference to our listening audience, Matthew 24, uh, Luke 17, Luke 21, Mark 13, all of these chapters go together. So yes. please read them. They're, they're accompanying chapters. But however, let's go to Matthew 24. Now, let's set the stage here. Uh, Jesus is with his disciples, and uh, we know um, uh, Jesus makes this statement, you know, not one stone shall be left upon another, referring, of course, to the temple and the buildings and so forth of Jerusalem. Uh, this uh, this put the disciples in a very um, perplexing situation. Now, they have heard in previous conversations with Christ about uh, the the second coming, the end of the world, yes. um, um, and, and various issues relative to the city of Jerusalem. However, though, they also have read uh, from the prophets of old. Um, where uh, through the covenant that God made with Abraham, how that and 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 the uh, renewal of that covenant throughout uh, Israel's history, uh, how that Jerusalem would be the centerpiece of the world, that would be eventually made the the uh, the capital of the universe in the sense that uh, it would be the crowning act of God's glory yes. at one day, and so forth and so on. So they're 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 perplexed. So they come to him, and this is found in verse 3, and they ask him this question. Tell us, when shall these things be? What should be the sign of thy coming to the end of the world? Because obviously they're, in their mind they're thinking, well, if, if, if Jerusalem is going to come to an end, and primarily Jesus is referring to the temple. Yes. So if he, And they're saying, well, if this is all going to come crashing down, the only conclusion we can come to, this must be what he was referring to before in previous conversations, his second coming, the end of the world, because – the only time that the, the in their mind they thought that the covenant would come to an end would be at the time when when the end of all things takes place. Now, what the disciples fail to recognize, which many people even today are deceived over, is the issue of the transference of the covenant. Yes. So, in other words, what they forgot to in, in many places is to is to remember the words in the book of Deuteronomy. Because this is the book of the covenant, and all you have to do is carefully read that book, and you will find that the covenant that God made with Abraham renewed uh, throughout the history of Israel, it, that that covenant is conditional. Yeah. It's not a not it's not a permanent covenant. In other words, it's not a covenant that God made with Israel that was unconditional. In other words, God, you can do whatever you want, however you want, for as long as you want, you'll still be my people. That's not what the covenant is, says. It doesn't say that at all because, as a matter of fact, we know that's not true based on Daniel chapter 9, uh, verses 24 to 27 and the 70 weeks. Yes. Because here he clearly says you only have 70 weeks left. And he says at the end of this time, if you don't do the following things, that's it. It's over for you. Now, that's clearly detailed in that prophecy. Yes. So we know that the covenant is not unconditional. We know it's conditional because in the book of Deuteronomy, you find two-letter word uh, in relation to the covenant, and that's if. God simply put it this way. If you obey me, I will bless you, and you will be my people. Yes. If you disobey me, I will curse you, and you. And if you continue in this, at some point, I will no longer allow you to be my my people. Now, let me just stop here for just a moment and 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 uh, elaborate a little bit further regarding the nature of the transference of the covenant, right. because as I say, many are deceived over this. So, when you look at the covenant that God made originally, uh, and and uh, and with Abraham, of course, there in Genesis chapter twelve, and you and you keep moving forward throughout the history of, the, of, the, of Israel. When you look at this covenant, as I said, it was it was conditional. But also when in relation to that, he called them after that point, my chosen people. Now, why does God designate them in that relationship, a chosen people? You see, even if you ask people today yes. uh, and you say, well, what were they chosen for? Get, uh, define the concept of chosen in relation to the covenant that God made with Israel. What does it mean to be the chosen people? They were chosen. They were chosen for a divine purpose yes. to reveal God to the fallen world, to get them to accept him as their Lord and Savior. 
and to to do a work on this earth to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah when he came the first time. Now, look, I'm sorry, our friends, for some of you who are listening audience or maybe uh, not understanding these things, but the children of Israel miserably failed yes. in this area. And uh, and this is what Jesus meant. He said, the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And when Jesus, that's Matthew 21. So when Jesus made that statement, when Jesus made that statement, the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to another nation. That's referring to the chosen concept, the idea that they are no longer now the chosen yes. to represent him on this earth. And so deception comes in many forms. And look what he says now. Look at what he says in verse 4. And Jesus added and said to them, take heed that no man do what? Deceive you. Uh, which the disciples were deceived over the covenant of uh, the transferring of the oh. covenants. So this led them to misunderstand the nature of the statement that he made. And this is another very important thing. When you are deceived, you can be reading scripture. The problem is, though, because of the deception that blinds your reason, you may not reason correctly regarding the nature of the things that you're reading. Right. So it leads you to misinterpret the meaning. Now, again, you may be sincere as you want to be, but sincerity doesn't sanctify the error that you just perpetrated. So he says, take heed that no man deceive you. Now, he clarifies. So this is a general statement. It's applicable to anything and everything. Mm -hmm. Then he goes and gets very specific. Verse 5, he says, for many shall come in my name. Now, they, now he begins to define the nature of the deception of the origin. Where does it come from? Saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Notice this does not refer just to the world. This is in terms of coming from the world. He, he's now talking about religious deception. Yes, Amen. I am Christ coming in my name. Look, go down to verse 11. He says, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive men false prophets that's religious in nature yes go over to verse 24 and there shall arise false christ false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders now this is very fascinating because sometimes a lie isn't enough sometimes a deception needs to be accompanied by right. something else that 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 uh, to put you over the top and so satan knows this and so what he's going to do is ratchet up the degree of the deception in other words with deceptions so let's say someone tells you a lie and you don't really buy into that lie so what is satan going to do he's going to uh, elevate the nature of that deception by accompanying that lie with miracles false miracles the manifestations yes, of of satanic deception so he's going to bring about supernatural acts to follow the lie in order to convince you now here's the irony of it all many people are going to believe the lie right off the bat some of them are not but what's going to happen is those who are in the middle and they see spiritualism manifested yes. manifested before them some supernatural act that's going to put them over the top and convince them, well, then the lie must be the truth, because how can I deny what I just saw? And so what's going to happen is to the person who stays faithful to Jesus Christ and is loyal to the truth and knows that the lie is not the truth and knows that the manifestation of satanic deception that was just revealed is also a lie. It puts enormous pressure upon them to maintain the integrity of the truth that yes. they hold. Because now the world is is against them. You know, listen, I'm convinced there's the nature of courage. <clears throat> there's physical courage, which very few people actually have. And excuse me. <clears throat> and then there's um, and then there's um, uh, spiritual or moral uh, oh. courage. And I don't think even fewer people have that. Um, so you need to be aware of that. That's that's the issue that you have to be aware of, of this kind of thing. Satan is going to bring about religious deception. Uh, it's coming from the religious world. It will yes. permeate throughout the world. Uh, matter of fact, go to Revelation chapter 3. Look at this. Look at what he says to the Laodicean church. Look at this. Just to show you how deceptive Satan's going to be. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Revelation 3, 18. Now, he says yes, this Lord. is talking to the Laodicean church. 
He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, the buying there is not of anything of, uh, in terms of uh, um, you know, purchasing with money in terms of – because you go back to Isaiah and he says you know, you, you're buying it with, with faith uh, in that sense. You know, and, the, and it's been purchased already by Christ. Right. So he's already bought this for you. He's just telling you by faith, come and accept them. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And the gold, of course, is faith and love through the trials and afflictions of life. He says, white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. Revelation 19, 8 tells you that's the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, uh, he says this, and anoint your eyes with eye salve. That thou mayest see. So the eyes have here is the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the yes, oil Lord. that is necessary that we may notice now, listen very carefully, that we may discern truth from error, that we may discern right from wrong. Yes. So it's spiritual discernment. Now, if deception was not going to be an issue in the last days, why then would Christ counsel us in the last days? especially the latest in church, he's telling his people, you better have spiritual discernment in these last days. Yes, right. You better be anointed by God Almighty, the Holy Spirit. You better understand that unless you have an, a special anointing by God Almighty, you will not stand in these last days. Yes. You're not, it's not going to happen. Go over to Matthew 13. Let's quickly go over there real quick. Matthew right. 13. Look at this. Matthew 13. Let's look here. Matthew 13. And let's look here, verses 14 to 17. Matthew 13, 14 to 17. Uh, yes, 14 to 7, Matthew, make sure I'm right, 13, 14 to 17. He says, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which uh, says, but hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. Now listen, this, uh, you know, on the surface, it doesn't make sense. They have ears to hear, but they cannot hear, which means they cannot understand. They have eyes to see, but they cannot see. They can't discern. Something's wrong. Something seriously is wrong here. He says, look what he goes on to say. For this people's heart is waxed gro uh, gross, and their ears are full of dull of hearing, and their eyes are closed. Lest at any time they should see their uh, with their eyes and their ears and uh, and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. In other words, unless they're converted, unless there's a born again experience, they're not going to be able to discern. They have That's eyes cool. they can see. They have ears they can hear. They have a heart. That that is that that has the uh, uh, the, the ability to, to to understand. But all of this means nothing unless you're anointed by God. Yes. He goes on to say this. He says, uh, he says, but blessed are your eyes. He's now speaking to his children. For they see and your ears, for they hear. He says, for truly I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things which you hear, see and have not right. seen, seen them. And to hear those things which you hear and have not heard them. So <clears throat> throughout time, the righteous have longed to see and hear these things of which Christ right. spoke of. He says, and in his day, here's Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to think that you and I, as well as our listening audience, if Jesus Christ were alive today physically on this earth and we had a chance to see him I would like to think we would be among the faithful who would love him and embrace him and follow him wherever he goes. Right. But in Jesus' day, the reality was simply this. Many who actually could touch him and hear him and see him, even though they had eyes to see, ears to hear, they chose not to follow him. Why? Because they were deceived. They were misled, and it all begins with the fact that they really don't want to hear or really follow nice. the truth. Look, we could go through many things. Look, go over to Psalm 115. Look at this, Psalm 115. Look what it says here, Psalm 115. Look at here with me in verse 5, Psalm 115, 5. It says, they have mouths, but they, they speak not, eyes, have they, but they see not. 
They have ears, but they hear not. Noses that they have, but they smell not. In other words, what's happening? They have all their senses, right? But their senses are disconnected from reality. And why? Because they've chosen a path of darkness uh, oh, because sorry. really, look, let's be honest. I think many people are led astray because fundamentally they love a lie more than they love the truth. And uh, I'm not right. saying that's in all cases. I think there are those who are genuinely true, who love God. And I believe this with all my heart, even if you're an honest, good person born again believer in Jesus Christ and you are deceived about some particular issue if you're faithful to God at some point in, in some point in your Christian experience he's going to open your eyes yeah, he's well. going to reveal to you the truth he's going to unravel this mystery and so where does deception really going to hit uh, look the bible makes it clear there's deception in the world satan's already got them blinded the people he's scared of are the people who have the word of god who, who, who read it, who pray, who study, who follow God. So he's scared of them because their eyes are open to the truth. They see him for what he is, and they see the lies for what they are. Yes, and Lord. not only that, they expose those lies in order to bring people out of the deception. That's the whole point of the second angel's message is to call people out of Babylon to open their eyes to the reality of the condition of things that exist. So where does most where is deception most likely to be found? Sadly to say, within the church. Yes. Within the religious <clears throat> realm. Sure. Yes. Um well Elder Ricardo, time is moving on quickly. And um I I really have nothing much more to state. Um now, what types of deception are there? Mm. Well, really, when you look at deception, there's really uh, two ways in which deception comes. Okay, let's look at this in a very practical way. One is the external, which is what we looked at. So in other words, someone is bringing the deception to you. Okay, so you have an outside force, um, and they are attempting to mislead you. Okay. Um, and of course, I will say this as well. The, someone may be honest in their deception and in their in their effort to share that particular um, doctrine with you uh, may in, in turn cause you to be led astray. So they don't really necessarily have an ulterior motive other than to share what they believe right. to be the truth. But again, sincerity doesn't sanctify the lie. Um, but nonetheless, nonetheless, regardless of the motivation, all right? There, the deception is external in nature. So, if you, so there's a deception outside of you. Someone right. is bringing the deception to you. So that's external. All right. Then we'll look at a couple of verses real quick on that uh, in a second. But let me uh, quickly get on to the other aspect, and that's internal. Now, internal deception is worse than external because right. the external deception is outside of you. Someone is trying to mislead you. I um, or 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 you're tr or you're going to or Satan is attempting to mislead you, uh, regardless of what the motivation may be of the person. So that's the act outside of you. Uh, the other is self-deception, and this is worse because it's not just the fact that someone um, may have in the past right. or um, you know led you down the wrong path, is that you've convinced yourself that the lie is the truth. And so when someone speaks the truth, you are so convinced that what they're speaking is actually a lie, when the reality is they are speaking the truth. But you are so blinded, self-deception, that you've convinced yourself that it is, it, that it is a lie. Right. And so, so uh, you know, white becomes black, black becomes white, uh, light becomes darkness, darkness becomes light. Uh, and this is what happens in the mind of someone who's self-deceived. So the deception is such that you have blinded your own eyes. Right. And it's a lot harder to come out of self-deception than to, than to come out of external deception. Because all you have to do is remove the external aspects. Yes, let's see. And, and, and you, you, you arrive to the ultimate conclusion. In this other case, when you're, it's internalized… Um, 
you've got to admit, you know, that and the problem really comes down to pride of opinion, uh, that you're the one that's the real crux of the problem. So let's look real quick. We're going to look real quick at external, external deception. Now, I read it to you, Matthew 24, 4, you know, beware, right? He says, many shall come in my name. That's a, that coming outside. That's a, an external aspect. Jesus talked about Matthew 24. But let's go over to quickly to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, real quick, verse 6. Matthew 5, excuse me, I'm sorry. Ephesians 5, 6. Ephesians 5, 6. It says this, let no man deceive you with vain words. So that's outside of you. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So he's warning you, don't let anybody deceive you. That's external Mm -hmm. deception. Second Thessalonians, go over to Second Thessalonians. And there in Second Thessalonians, all right, look what it says here in Second Thessalonians. And uh, we're looking here, Second Thessalonians. Oh, my uh, chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 3, he says this, let no man deceive you by any means. So again, Paul saying the same thing. Don't yes, let someone yes. mislead you. Don't be deceived by these people. It's external by nature. And there are many other verses, by the way, that deal with this. I would recommend to our listening audience, take a Bible concordance like Cruden's Concordance, Strong's or um, Young's Concordance, and look up the word deception or deceive, and you will see many, many Bible verses that deal with this subject that will fascinate you over this whole issue. So let's look real quick now at internal deception, self-deception. James, let's go to the the, the book of James, and let's look at chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 22, we're talking about self-deception. Look what he says here, all right? He says, but be ye doers of the word, and not only hearers, deceiving your own selves. So here we have internalized deception. Don't be deceived. And really what he really means is this, don't be naive. Don't be naive that you can't be misled. And don't be naive to think that you aren't wrong about a position. And so, in other words, you know, don't be self-deceived. Let's go also look real quick. First Corinthians, first yes, Corinthians, right. first Corinthians. Go over to chapter three, first Corinthians, chapter three. And let's look at verse 18. First Corinthians three eighteen. He says this, let, let no man deceive himself. Right. Notice, let no man deceive him. That's internalized. If any man among you seems to be wise or thinks himself to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. In other words, humble yourself. And you think you're so smart that you can't be led astray? Really? You don't really believe that, do you? Are you so gullible and naive to think that you can't be uh, led down the, the path of, uh, mm. of error? So he, Paul is warning you. He says, look, don't be self-deceived over this. So self-deception is the worst type. It wow. really is. So there's inter- there's external and internal. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> well, praise the Lord. Well, the time is basically almost over, but we still um, must ask, how can you ensure that you are not deceived today? And I know that you've covered it in part, um, but again, how can you ensure that you are not deceived today? Well, I'll tell you this. Look, like you said, we did cover some of this already, at least some aspects of it. But let me really give you the crux of it. And Isaiah 820, I think this really is the foundation. Yes. And it says this in Isaiah 820 to the law and to the testimony. If they, and that's whoever that might be. If they speak not according to this word, if they don't speak according to the Bible and vindicate the Ten Commandments, not nine commandments, yes. the Ten Commandments. And we're not talking about the ceremonial law. We're talking about the moral law. Amen. So to the law and to the testimony, the testimony of the prophets, which is the word of God, the Old and the New Testament, let me make that clear as well. We don't reject the one to embrace the other. We embrace both. 
And, and the New Testament does not contradict the old, nor does the old contradict the new. They're one and the same. It's a continuation. One is pointing forward to the coming of the, of the Messiah and the fulfillment of the, of the Holy Christ. The other is the fulfillment, showing you the, the, what the Holy Messiah um, uh, has done and is doing for yes. us today. So to the law and to the testimony, if they, whoever that might be, speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. There is no truth in them. So what is the standard by which we are to use uh, in order that we are not misled? The word of God. If they're not Amen. speaking according to the word of the Lord, dear friends, turn away, go away. Now, let me qualify and recap a little bit of what we talked about. You need to be, you need to stay humble. As Paul says in Corinthians, stay humble with the Lord. Don't think that you can't be led astray. If in the process you find that maybe there's a question in your mind regarding something, don't rush to judgment. Pray, commit it to God, and in due time the Lord will reveal the truth to you. Where? From the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. He will show you the truth. He will reveal the truth to you. God is in the business of revealing the truth. It is Satan's desire to lead you into lies, into error. So how can we ensure that we're not going to be led astray? Number one, stay humble, uh, you know, follow the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that you know and understand. And most importantly, anchor yourself in a thus saith the Lord. Amen. We'll have a short break for some music now and we'll round off with some closing thoughts. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who could have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, he rescued the souls of man counselor comforter keeper spirit we long to embrace you offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way lost the way you are the one that we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for always hunger Mighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own. Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. that we praise you are the one we adore you give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for oh our hearts 
受未尝的。The one that we praise, you are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger. What does it mean to be deceived? Out of the corner, closing thoughts for this evening, please. Well, I think when you again look at this subject,、um, I think it's imperative that we recognize how depraved we really are. I mean, the humanity, the human nature of man—it's it's very corrupt and evil. And I think once we realize that and recognize how sick we really are, I think then it leads us to the ultimate conclusion, and that we need help. And the help lies not in drugs, not in alcohol, not in you know any other worldly thing that this world can offer,、uh, but in Jesus Christ. That's our solution. And I think that、uh, we need to be humble before the Lord, walk with Him, and recognize. That、uh, that he is the only hope we have, and I think if we follow him and、uh, put our faith and trust in him, not in a denomination, not in not in preachers, not in church committees or anything else or anyone else, but in in Jesus Christ and follow the the holy word of God, I really truly believe if you have a, a an honest heart. You you will be led in the into the truth, and you will be uh, uh, prevented from going into a multitude of deceptions. And even if you should be deceived over something, as long as your heart is genuine and true, and you're willing to follow God's lead, He will eventually lead you out of that deception. So I want to encourage our our listening audience: follow the Lord Jesus Christ, stay faithful to Him. And be true to the word of the Lord, because that is the standard by which we measure all truths, all lies. It's all. It is the only way in which we can discern between right and wrong. Amen. Elder De Carlo, shall we end tonight with a word of prayer?、Mm. Once again, Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, with thankful hearts to know that you have. Warned us time and time again that our only hope in this world is found in Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll keep us from deception. Help us, Lord, Lord, to watch and to pray, to be vigilant in every way. Now, Lord, I know that we can't do this on our own, for we are corrupt. We are evil in so many ways. But I ask, dear God, that you give us a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit, as you promised in Ezekiel thirty-six twenty-four to thirty. And the Lord, that you will anoint our eyes with thy salve, that we may see. That you'll pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, O Lord. That you'll grant us thy loving kindness. And so, Lord, today we thank you once again for everything you've ever done for us and continue to do for us. Bless us and keep us now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Elder De Carlo, thank you for joining us on Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio. Listeners, if you have any questions, or if you would like more information, please send an email to inquiries at wildernesspublications dot org, or you can send a text message to zero seven nine four four zero six two seven eight six. If you live in the United Kingdom, please contact us with your name and address. And we will send you a free tract called Fourth Shepherds. If you have the Android app for Voice in the Wilderness Internet Radio, go to the ebook section, then find the title Bible Readings for the Home. 
at chapter 164, you will find the subject, Four Shepherds. This section will give you more information about today's topic. You can also listen to and download our radio show podcasts at https colon forward slash forward slash voice dash i n dash t h e dash wilderness dot podcast page dot i o forward slash well that's it for tonight's show listeners good night and god bless you voice in the wilderness internet radio enlightening the world every week it's not just knowing about the doctrine in the bible that is not what we stand for here Streaming powerful biblically based messages. This congregation may never be gathered together again as we see it. Voice in the Wilderness, Internet Radio. Enlightening the world every week.